Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support this programming, you can join the channel directly on YouTube at multiple levels, or better yet, hit up the Substack or the Patreon. That's oxum.substack.com or patreon.com slash oxum. Our guest today is the Pine Baron. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks. Thanks for having me on, Enoch. No problem. No problem. I'd love, I'd love to have you on there's um you know we'll we'll try a we had a great discussion beforehand about the clouds and the dirt which is this uh, idea i picked up from gary vaynerchuk who's my spirit uh, animal of entrepreneurship <laughs> and hopefully he's not uh, one of the quacks that that you've taken down because i've enjoyed a lot of your threads on uh, some of the tycoons and magnates and and we can get to that but um i i, I like names and i i really do like getting into names a little bit so if we can, I want to set this up to get your thoughts. But uh, Balaji is a, a thinker that I have seen talk about um, anonymity versus pseudonymity. And the reason I bring that up is there's like the larger conversation of in language study, words that are used kind of technically versus words that are used loosely every day. So there's this like, hey, anon meme that gets spread around a lot on Twitter and elsewhere, but I think it's more accurate to call, I think some of my favorite cast of characters, pseudonymous rather than anonymous. And I, I wonder if you have any hot takes about the difference between that, or if you've ever like uh, thought about it. Yeah, well, I think I saw the same thing by Balaji and I admire him a lot. I think he's very smart. Um, and I intuitively got to the same place, but he did a really good job formalizing it. And I, I believe the examples he used were 4chan, which is truly anonymous and, you know, obviously a shit show of <laughs> transgressive content um, versus someone like me uh, as the Pine Baron, where I'm pseudonymous. I'm not using my birth certificate name, but I'm using a specific name to identify me and my project as a public communicator. Um, and so there's, yeah, there's 4chan, fully anonymous, there's pseudonymous, like my Twitter account, Pine Baron. And then there's de-anonymous, which I imagine is you using your full legal name. That's right. That's right. And I've I've found it stupid, the people who only want everything verified names. At the same time, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, the way you described 4chan is probably how I would describe it. And, you know, I was on there back in uh, the early <laughs> aughts, you know. Uh, so there there's something i don't know i don't know if it's accountability but what i don't know what is it that you think that separates the pseudonym versus the totally not like why is having a pseudonym less of a shit show like your I identity being retained or some reputation thing yeah exactly i mean i'm you know i make no secret that i'm a businessman um and more so than a businessman i want to write interesting things i can be proud of um, and I want to take feedback and I want to make them better. So if I'm just anonymous, I don't have that iterative process uh, whereby I can, you know, write things, take feedback. People can kind of see the evolution of my work. But also to be really blunt about it, I want to sell things. And I have no problem buying or selling from someone who's pseudonymous. I purchased a course in real estate from a guy who goes uh, goes by the real estate god. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't I don't know his real name. I don't need to know his real name. You know, I knew people recommend his course highly and it's really good, but I would not have purchased that real estate course, you know, from truly like user number seven, one, eight, five, six, three, you know. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, I did a, a quality assurance or QA boot camp and then I got certified in in Scrum. And I know a lot of people in tech actually get mad at the specifics but the general idea that you mentioned about iterative and incremental development when you get like feedback from leadership in this case your your leadership but also from the customer base that's, that's so brilliant that's so key it's it's behind i think all of the great innovations of our time just the last note on the the name piece i think it was in world war one I. I could be corrected but there's that famous uh, fighter pilot the red baron um i actually had a, a basketball team a club basketball team with some friends and we used to be called the red barons based off of him and based off of a, a friend whose legal name is that 
but there's also kind of the barons of the the gilded age in american history are either of those or none of those the inspiration yeah great question so let me just speak to um why i'm pseudonymous uh real quick because as you pointed out there neither one of us cares for true anonymity but that's interesting too i mean i think there is a role for that true shouts from the mob role in our public square but neither of us value that for our projects so for me the decision was between you know full birth certificate name versus a pseudonym and i mean ultimately i will stand behind whatever i say a hundred percent but i have business partners i have banks who loan me money i have tenants who rent houses for me and kind of in this age of of cancel culture and all i just decided it'd be best to write uh under a pseudonym and and also on a very practical strategic level you can always go from a pseudonym uh to de-anonymous mm -hmm. the other direction is much harder <laughs> so right. this bought me some optionality as well yeah i think both Pete Quinones and Curtis Yarvin went through those processes. Um, one of those, I think, was voluntary. The other, more involuntary. But yeah, it it has, um, you know, it has happened before. And then, you know, the funny thing about that is, even after you go to that, you could always go again to a pseudonym. And and the idea is that nobody would know. Although maybe some people could guess if they see certain trends. Um, and actually. On that note, very briefly, and then I do want to get into the the meat of our conversation, which is the things that you're selling, and I want people to to know about that as well because I think it's very helpful the transition that you have made from employment to self employment. You found out about the show, I imagine, at least from one of our episodes, if not an another episode. Is there anything you can uh, <laughs> say about this programming or anything that surprised you or shocked you that pleased you or you were displeased with in any direction you can take it yeah well i'm a big fan of yours um partially because it's so far outside of my orbit um the you know more like i've i've fallen more into small business entrepreneurship social media which is super valuable but it's also i mean you know we're we're social media friends and the, the problem with even very good business content is it's self-terminating like you either mm. learn how to achieve that goal or you don't but either yeah. way, you're not going to fall. Like, I was a huge Tim Ferriss guy. I know you like Gary Vaynerchuk. And the yeah. thing is, I, I listened to Tim religiously for a few years, but I kind of did it. Like, I started my business. I, you yeah. know, I achieved kind of the goals I had. And so that kind of very specific business or self-help content, it should have an end point, even, even good stuff. Um, whereas I try to still keep a little bit of a, a foot in the world of more philosophical or artistic stuff. And, and that's why I love seeing you on my timeline and, and specifically, you know, sharing uh, stories about your homeland and, you know, stories I find very interesting, which are so outside of my orbit. Um, so I like the, uh, <laughs> the uh, African centric uh, stuff you share. It's, it's just, it's Thank so you. novel to me. So that's probably uh, the, the biggest reason I'm a fan of yours. Thank you. I appreciate that. And entrepreneurship is something that I, it's always been a part of, I mean, like, uh, the way I would say it is like super micro entrepreneurship. My issue has always been an issue of scale, but like, I was like a kid making, you know, fuzzy ball creatures and paper plane, uh, paper planes and paper boats and other origami stuff. And like trying to sell it to, you know, neighbors, aunts, uncles, and, you know, silly shit like that. But the, the kind of, you know, steady baseball card selling, uh, which I did some of in Pokemon cards, uh, but like on a huge scale and grinding at swap meets like Gary Vaynerchuk did, I definitely didn't. And he's he's one of the many people in Tim Ferriss's uh, Tools for Titans. I actually saw Tim Ferriss speak live in, in Los Angeles when he came to visit um, alongside Terry Crews, which was a funny uh, conversation between the two of them. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah. Funny I, uh, height difference. Yeah, like body huge. type difference. <laughs> huge. Oh, 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 Tim. Tim is kind of jacked. He's kind of jacked. That's yeah, yeah, he him, is. Right? The but, the four uh, hour yeah. body workout, which is like a hundred kettlebell swings or something like that. Um, <laughs> not like Terry Crews, though. I guess not no. many people are. <laughs> Very few. Um, and 
you know, I don't know how natural it is, but if he's totally a, a natty, then I really respect it. One of the big things from Terry Crews that I actually picked up, and I've seen many, many other places, including, you know, the African homeland is um, intermittent fasting, which is, you know, it's kind of a buzzword nowadays, but he, his like window of eating is like 2 p.m. to 8 p.m., something like that. And so, you know, it being that jacked is not just about like, eating until you throw up like <laughs> you can have some semblance of self-control um, but I, I did want to get into into the meat of it could you talk to us about how you quit your nine to five job and became self-employed in which I you know it's kind of the first thing to dispel but I imagine the first thing that most people say in that regard is that you end up working like more than that I don't know if it's reversed to five to nine but whatever the new schedule became yeah, well, let me, um, cause you asked a good question about the Pine Barren name. So let me kick it back to that real quick. And I, I have a way to circle back around. So, uh, I think it was probably inspired by the infamous forest in New Jersey called the Pine Barrens. And it was just a little bit of a play on words. Um, but I am a Baron in the literal sense of minor nobility. Um, you know, I nice. have some money. I have some, I own some rental real estate, you know, just like uh, literal minor nobility of previous eras. And I do mean minor, you know, compared to many very impressive people, you know, I'm still fairly new on my journey. I'm really proud of what I've achieved. Um, literally, I, I own a 15 unit uh, rental portfolio um, in a scenic mountain area. So, so when I say barren, I, I really am a barren in, in the literal sense of the word that you know, I own some land. There's some people who pay me rent every month. Um, and the funny thing is it was aspirational when I started the account. I didn't even own a house for myself. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm proud to say I've lived up to that Pine Barren name since I started it. That's amazing. So so and, you started it um, aspirationally and you achieved it at some point. How did you get from the aspiration to the achievement? Like what was your previous field that you were employed in yeah so that's the uh, million dollar question right so and, and i want to point out i've achieved both the pine part and the barren part <laughs> i've i've always deeply loved uh the mountains and ski towns and, and hiking and uh ice skating um and i did move to a rural mountainous area so it's, it's not just the barren part i achieved the pine parts yeah, the pine part the mountainous part is very deep yeah. in religious literature in you know especially in the near east you know like the the context of the bible the both the jews and all of their neighbors who had different religions they all went up onto like mountains to worship so there's there's something like divine about being on a mountain Sure. And I can think of the legendary mountains, uh, Masada, Mount Sinai, of course. Yeah, they, they, they have played a prominent role. And Ethiopia is very mountainous, isn't it? Has a... It's got 70% of the mountains in Africa. Wow. That's, yeah, that's remarkable. I'd love to see some photos from you. Um, but yeah, to your point about how I did it. Um, so first off, let me make a shameless plug. I Please wrote do. up an, yeah, I wrote up an essay about this. Um, uh, in detail because it was very important, uh, part of my life. And I think a lot of people have similar goals. Um, so if you sign up for my email newsletter, uh, you go to signup.wealthpin.com. Um, I'll send you a free copy of that essay, but I'm very proud of it because I wrote up in great detail, but I'll, I'll share it with you here now. But if you want it in written format, yes, yeah, signup.wealthpin.com. You can get there from my Twitter account too. Um, I'll send you a free copy of this essay I wrote up in great detail about how I did it. Yeah, that, that's um, excellent. People should definitely listen and read that. Yeah. So um, now I, um, so part of my journey and, and to tell people that it's possible, I don't have a bachelor's degree. I don't come from a wealthy family. Um, I didn't have much social capital. So I don't want anyone to feel like that holds them back. Um, now I did come from an educated family. <laughs> <laughs> my mm -hmm. family probably should have been wealthy, but my, my parents struggled. Uh, so yeah, go into a prestigious college or, uh, you know, connections to the business world was just not something I had. So I, I do want to tell people it, it's very possible. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to have a prestigious family or background or resume to do this. Um, so I want to make that very clear. 
Um, and then uh, the so really it's a, it's a two part equation, and I'll focus more on so. Despite that background, I was able to eventually break into a, you know, fairly high upside white collar career field in digital marketing, working mm -hmm. for a big marketing company. And I worked there for about three, four years. Um, and that's an important part of the story because I do not recommend people just start from scratch. Mm -hmm. There's so much insider knowledge so many personal connections you need that it doesn't matter how smart or talented you are you have to spend some time inside the belly of the beast and you could potentially do that as a freelancer or a contractor but for me part of quitting the day job the day job part is still important and i don't recommend people uh do that until they've had a chance to work for a few years build some skills and build a network so um, that's kind of step one to quitting your day job is don't do it right away. Yep. <laughs> and this is in the essay. I talk about how now I took that very seriously from the day I was hired. I knew that I wanted to go off and do my own thing. So I was networking really aggressively. I was saving people's phones and email addresses to my personal stuff, not just my work email. I was going to events and introducing myself to people and building a portfolio. So do it deliberately, but definitely valuable to spend some time in the belly of the beast. Yeah, I rage quit a, a few years ago, about five years ago, actually. You know, my field was originally dispute resolution or mediation, you know, settling matters outside of court. And I did it for a couple of universities, one in North Dakota, one in Central California, and uh, ended up, you know, rage quitting from those situations because I saw things in the systems that I didn't like. But I definitely did it too early. You know, you add up all that time and, and grad school, it's, it's going to be two years or around there, you know, not three to four years and in different places, to your point. So those connections, I think maybe now with, with the prol uh, proliferation of Zoom and Google Meet and all those alternative video chats, it's easier to have kind of national connections, but is did you find yourself you know staying locally or did you you know head over to like a totally new city whenever you made that transition yeah good uh question it, it does make for a funny story by the way that you rage quit uh mediation <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, that's like you, that. you always need that option um you know yeah. i'm a jujitsu guy too and my jujitsu professors say you know the the best move once you guy uh the guy on the floor is to run away yeah, I like that. And and certainly true in any real life conflict situation, I would think. Um, so yeah, good question. I did um, stick around the same area because that's where my contacts were for a bit. So again, I, I want to say I did this very strategically. Mm -hmm. Like um, the metaphor I go back to is always a poker one. There's a poker strategy uh, known as tight aggressive. So it means pick your spot very carefully. Um, but once you have it, go after it aggressively. And that's how I try to approach business. So I, you know, I was aggressive and confident in the sense that I quit a day job. I started my own business, but I did it very strategically. I didn't rush into it. So, yeah, so I spent a couple of years building up contacts and then I didn't quit until I had contracts lined up. And I was pretty mm -hmm. careful about my non-compete um, as well. Um, some people say they're not enforceable, obviously talk to your own lawyer, but yeah. I deliberately, um, lined up contracts, marketing a different product than I was before, you know, to be careful about that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I didn't I quit until, so, sorry, say that again. I think it's state by state. I, I had that come up. I used to be a headhunter and I had it come up in the okay. state of California. So I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice, but I believe in the state of <laughs> yeah. California. That's not you know, you're all right. But in other states, <laughs> like he said. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and so, yeah, all that's to say, so I was very strategic and I didn't quit until I had contracts lined up, uh, ready to go. Um, and, uh, I did it as well with a business partner, which helped to, um, it's, you know, our world, um, we make a lot of money. If our advertising does well, we make very little money if it doesn't do well. And by working with a partner, kind of doubling the shots on goal, that was also part of my strategy to, to smooth out the roller coaster 
of not having that steady paycheck. So, um, so when I quit, I already had a business partner uh, lined up and I already had a, a contract lined up, ready to go in a similar space. And I stuck around the area for a good another year and a half, two years until I had built up a book of business. Um, so yeah, it was a pretty long process, uh, you know, till I was actually able to move to my dream house in the, uh, rural mountains. That, and, that's uh, amazing. And, and so, um, you know, I know you had this great thread on, um, you know, as an aside to the Amharic adage, again, we have this thing both in Giz and in Amharic poetry called wax and gold, where the wax is the outer layer similar to um what uh what's his name james burnham in the machiavellians what he would call you know formal truth versus the real thing and the real thing in the adage would be gold so the gold is hidden underneath the wax and i i say that to say you have this great thread on people like tim ferris and gary vaynerchuk to go back to a second they, they get a lot of criticism but i do think they have some gems um I think you're right about once you get it, you don't need them anymore. And Gary Vaynerchuk was explicit about that in his books. You know, he was explicit about how he didn't write his books. He paid a ghostwriter to write them. He's a speaker, not a real writer, but he knew that people read. So he paid uh, a ghostwriter to do that for him. I think he did his most recent audio book. But other than that, he had uh, been outsourcing a lot of that. But what he says is once you get it, that's enough. Like, stop it stop reading me stop listening to my content go and do this stuff for him it's like beginner level garage sale or lemonade stand and then leveling up to wherever you get and i know tim ferris's most famous thing is kind of getting the the passive income so this transition from getting your own marketing clients with a, another business partner and and securing income that way how come you didn't stay there? Like, is it Tim Ferriss influence to get passive income via real estate? Or is it something else going on there in terms of adding to your portfolios? Yeah, well, good question. You talked about a lot of subjects uh, near and dear to my heart. Man, I'm, <laughs> I'm not just trying to schmooze you when I say good questions. You're uh, <laughs> you're doing a good job with the interview. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I do still run a marketing agency. So mm -hmm. the uh, the money's good. We really like the clients we have. Um, so yes, the real estate was uh, was a step in the direction uh, towards, you know, st not having to trade time for money. But I'm still fairly young and I still love creating marketing campaigns, you know, for the same reason I love being on Twitter. Like I like being creative and playing with language and coming up with surprising and novel ways to catch people's attention. So I do still um, uh, take clients and I enjoy it and I intend to do it for a long time, but uh, not forever, you know, so I, mm -hmm. I could easily see myself doing it for the next 20 years. Um, but, um, you know, the, the real estate for me is really kind of more of my retirement account, a way to take care of my wife so she doesn't have to work, you know, income for her. Um, and it, it is, yeah, a, a step in the direction of not having to trade my time for money. But I mean, I never want to retire. I want to work on fun projects that I'm proud of and selling things that I believe will really give people a lot of value. But, um, you know, I want to work as long as I'm physically able. Yeah, no, that that's beautiful. So um, what what can you say about some of the things that some of these tycoons or magnates or or barons like they say this is how you make money but you were able to kind of you know peek behind the curtain at what their real mechanism for money making was and i thought that was really great that you did that what can you say about that yeah i'm glad that it resonated with you it's a really fun topic to me and um, I have worked with a lot of big marketers and names people uh, have maybe heard of a lot of big brands. So I have seen behind the curtain and none of this is to take away from these people's success, by the way. Like mm -hmm. I greatly admire Gary Vaynerchuk. I greatly admire Tim Ferriss or Tony Robbins. Yeah. Um, but yeah, often it's kind of like you have to read between the lines to see what, what really works. So for example, Tim Ferriss made his name with the four hour work week. Uh, a book about building systems within your business so it can keep making you money without you having to work that hard. 
Um, which is true. You know, if you follow that advice, it's, it's helpful. It's a little outdated now, which he would probably agree with, but mm -hmm. it's an older business book. But if you read between the lines, what, what made Tim Ferriss really successful was he started a supplement brand in California pretty early on when, especially when new tropic supplements were taken <laughs> off. So the reason he made a lot of money is not because he had great organizational systems for his assistants. It's because he started selling brain supplements right when they were taken off big. And that's, I think, kind of the more important lesson. <laughs> Excuse <laughs> me about Tim Ferriss. Yeah, know the trends and, and follow the trends. And that relates kind of to what you were saying about how you like to experiment and be creative on Twitter as long as the, the Twitter deities allow us and we'll see if uh, <laughs> the non-hostile takeover that they keep talking about with Elon actually ends up happening and, and what what that would do. Um, you know, I like to experiment too. I actually just became a Twitter blue person. So I'm like paying three bucks a month for Twitter. Nice. Because, uh, now I get no ads, which, you know, people can have like opinions. Some of them are dogmatic about wanting to never pay for a product, but I definitely believe in paying for products that work and that you use every day. And I, again, I'm just experimenting. $3 is not going to hurt my budget. But um, already I could say I have like a more pleasing viewing experience because I feel that my creativity is destroyed when my thoughts keep getting interrupted. But I know some of the things that you've done creatively is experiment to see what tweets get like the, you know, the most interactions, whether it be from quotes or likes or replies or whatever the, the metric is. Do you have any that uh, come to mind? And could you talk about kind of that creative process? Yeah, well, first off, I think you just sold me on Twitter blue. I didn't realize it blocked all <laughs> ads, but I'll, I'll pay three bucks a month for that. Though sometimes I do feel like a small sense of power when I see a really annoying ad and I block it. Yeah, I yeah. Like it. I, I'm trying to Just Twitter a, blue pill you. Yeah, no, I'm 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 sold. Um, yeah, so that's something I've written about as well. If you go to so at Spirit of Pines is my Twitter, and if you go to the top of my feed, um, you'll see a collection of my threads, and so that's something I've written about as well. Uh, kind of experimenting and how to get threads to go viral, mm -hmm. and the uh, the biggest one I did. Um, got something like 125,000 likes, 10 million views. Um, and for me, most importantly, like a thousand signups to my email newsletter. There because, we go. Yeah, this is, you know, what I always tell people, you know, don't work for Twitter for free. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to have a goal of growing a business, but, you know, it's good to have a goal, whether it's to put your ideas out there, grow your personal profile, so, so that's, that's key is like, I, I don't want to just give Twitter great content for free. I want, you know, for, in my case, it's getting signups to my newsletter. Yeah, so the black yeah, Twitter, I, I don't know if you're how aware you are of black Twitter, but the black Twitter kind of like cliche is that whenever you get a viral tweet, you make sure that your first reply, which ends up being like a mini thread. If you're a man, if you're a black man, it's your SoundCloud. If you're a black woman, it's usually your cash app. <laughs> It's a, uh, you know, it's hilarious. And some people are like, oh, I don't have it. So they'll put like a, their nonprofit of their choice. Yeah, it's funny. I haven't seen that, but uh, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, you know, if you're good at something, don't do it for free. Um, so to the specifics about going viral, I, I can run down real quick. So the uh, tweet that took off, it was a joke about Brooklyn barbecue. Um which really gets people's attention because i said you know it's this really wimpy looking plate of barbecue and i said where else but brooklyn can you get all this for just 60 dollars <laughs> um so it's a little bit you know it's tongue-in-cheek um it had an image i think you know if you want to reach a certain level of virality you just need that image to catch people's attention on a crowded mm -hmm. timeline and these by the way are similar principles i use in my marketing agency it's like Internet marketing is so crowded. You have to think really carefully about how you're going to stand out in a, you know, a really saturated landscape. Um, so I had the, the funny attention getting image. I had the tongue in cheek caption. And then I had a little bit of a thread where I added on some jokes about it. And then a nice little turn into, oh, hey, by the way, this is all a goof. If you want more of my writing, sign up for the email newsletter. And, you know, I can't promise that all of these will get hundreds of thousands of likes and thousands of retweets, but that's a pretty viable formula. And I, I've certainly 
you know, I've only gotten that big once, but I've certainly had threads do many thousands of retweets and likes following those same principles. Yeah, that's that's beautifully said. And the conversion of the of the subscriptions, which then lead to other conversions in terms of sales is yeah, that's that's what we're looking for. That's what anybody who's doing this other otherwise it's you know and i think this is something that's been repeated often i even saw it today people speaking about it but it's like it may have even been you that i saw and others i think commenting but the idea of some people wanting to be famous just for fame's sake as opposed to some people preferring to be rich you know obviously you know there's the the combo where richness uh, or you know wealth dovetails being famous but if you had to pick between the one of them you'd rather have money in your pocket than than fame but i think it takes a certain level of humility because there's a, a certain vanity of some people that would they would rather have the other one and hey if, if that's their thing that's their thing but i think i know where the pine baron and i stand on that equation yeah absolutely and and we were talking about this this morning i mean i've even refined that pitch to say I'd rather be rich than right. You know, when I was a <laughs> young man, very passionate about my ideas, I, you know, and you get in these long arguments, uh, dying on a hill. And, and sometimes it's, you know, it's something fairly trivial, like about a opinion about a, a music group or something. And the older I get, it's like, I don't even care about being right. <laughs> I just, mm. I want to be happy. And, and to be clear, you know, we're talking a lot about money and, and money's important to me. I, I didn't have any when I was young. I have some now. I've worked really hard. I want to make more. But it's, you know, money's just a tool. What what I really want is is freedom and, and power, you know, power yeah. over my own life, the way I spend my time. So yeah, money's very important to me, but only in so much as it buys me the life I want. And that's why, you know, I know these I have a friend from high school who has a very prestigious job uh, as a Manhattan lawyer. And he worked 70 to 80 hour weeks, you know, pouring over fine print and contracts every day. And we, you know, he, he makes really good money, but to me, it's like, what's the point of making money if it doesn't buy you the life you want? I, I a hundred percent agree. I don't know if, you know, these numbers are real, but I've heard people talking about different happiness quotients and talking about like up to a hundred K it matters. But, you know, after that, it, whatever the truth of their you know fake science is uh <laughs> there is some point of diminishing returns with how much money you make and how much your your time you're losing of course there are people in living in the bay area who says uh you know you're poor if you have 100k right now but you know i don't think uh, that's the case when we look at the median incomes of, of the various cities i think that in la it's like 39k and i don't know what the national standard is but i'm sure it's going to be different with uh different contexts there but yeah the power and freedom point to have your own family whether you have fu money or not to to feel a little bit of that ability that nobody is kind of uh commandeering you around i used to read the the left libertarians a lot uh particularly the the market anarchists and they had this thing where they believed a lot of the systems in the united states are rigged towards employment and um, I, I think their arguments were powerful, actually, that a lot well, of well, that's people want you to so, sorry to interrupt, but it's, it's it's tax season right now. So mm -hmm. That's true beyond a shadow of a doubt The the system really wants you to be a part of the, the system. And, you know, I don't believe that's from a shadowy conspiracy. It's just like a evolutionary function of the system. It, you know, the individual players want to increase their own power. Um, yes. So. Um, but yeah, a hundred percent it using banks as, you know, I I've made good money, but I'm still technically a small business owner, but mm -hmm. doing my taxes using bags, it's an enormous nightmare, you know, health insurance, uh, owning my own business. Yeah. The, the system really wants you to stay inside the system and it, it punishes you for stepping out. <laughs> and that's why I think, you know, it's worth doing like the reward has been enormous, but I want to be honest with people. Like when you quit your job, you're going to have a headache about taxes and health insurance and banking. So I want to be very clear about that. You you bring up a point that's been a hot topic, you know, ever since Obamacare, but you, you're a young guy. Is it that you didn't feel that you needed health insurance in the interim or 
you know, how quick was the turnaround where you were able to make sure that that's taken care of, whether it's a hassle or not? Because I think that's the big thing that keeps people employed rather than unemployed from what I've heard from people is the security and stability of the health insurance provided by your employer. Yeah, no, I, you know, I think I need health insurance. <laughs> uh, it's just, it sucks. Like I spent a lot of time talking to brokers and comparing quotes and it's just, it's really expensive. It's really time consuming. Um, same thing with retirement plans. You know, I was looking into opening a retirement plan for my business and it's just, if they're like, if, if you don't have a hundred employees, it's really hard to get a good deal on health insurance or, um, and I don't have a hundred employees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, <clears throat> it's just any kind of, uh, leverage comes from like having that sort of scale. So when you just have a couple employees, you and your business partner, it's really hard to get health insurance or retirement accounts or, or frankly, any kind of good business options. So, um, but you know, like I said, I'm, you know, I live in the beautiful rural mountains. I have total control of my own time. So it's definitely worth it. It just, uh, especially the week taxes are due. <laughs> it's frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, today, I think today is like we're recording on like the day of that it's due. And then I think official tax day or something is uh, the 18th Monday. Yeah. One of the things we were discussing there stuck out to me because I, I have friends and family who are who've gone that route too, the kind of Wall Street route where you give over all your time for what you think is, you know, the biggest pay that you can, but you're receiving it from someone else as opposed to getting it yourself. So in the transition from employment to self-employment, um, did you find yourself, okay, you're not working 80 hours. Are you working the same amount of hours as you worked before, uh, but it feels better because it's for yourself or are you working less hours or more hours? I'm working about the same hours and a uh, good question. <laughs> I want to be very honest. And that's a ton of hours because I was in a, you know, a, a position where I made more money if my advertisements did better. So a normal work week was was a joke. It's like I was always constantly trying to put in the hours to make my advertisements perform better. So I so I would make more and have more power within the company. And and I work a similar amount of hours. It would frankly be hard to work more hours mm -hmm. <laughs> without taking powerful stimulants. <laughs> and I'll just real quick say, I, I, I understand they work and that's part of why I'm against them. Cause that's a real deal with the devil and yeah. it's real common in my industry, but I, I don't take stimulants, uh, outside of coffee. So, um, yeah, so I, I worked a lot of hours before I work a lot of hours now, but, but to your point, Enoch, yeah, it's it just the mental change of it being on my own behalf is, is huge. And the fact that it's not busy work, like if I'm doing something, it's because I think it's valuable to one of my companies. It's not because my boss told me to do it or I have to, you know, earn a certificate or I have to take a training from HR, you know, so it, it, it the, the work is much more deliberate now too. Yeah, that's no, that's a, a, a solid point that you are working a, you know, a good amount of hours but it's almost like your your brain space is freed up because of that um well that's i think been very helpful i appreciate a lot of the, the time that you've given us today pine baron i hope people take these tips and apply them to their lives or if they're not you know stay satisfied with the nine to five life if that is the life that they choose just they no longer get to complain about it could you once again plug uh, wealth pin and anything else you want to you know your twitter or anything else and give any sort of parting wisdom and advice to my audience yeah well i really appreciate you having me on enoch like i said i've been a fan of yours of the, of the podcast and uh your twitter for a while it's nice to to finally talk um yeah you know entrepreneurship is not suited for everyone now i think a lot of people could be happier uh quitting their day job and and working as a consultant or quitting their day job and, and getting a, a remote job somewhere, but actually running a business and having employees, it's really hard. It's really frustrating. So the first thing I would say is, um, yeah, it's, uh, for a lot of people, the day job is a good option. Um, and for a lot of people, a sort of intermediate step of being a consultant or a well-paid remote worker is probably the best of both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> so when you start having to hire people and start your own business uh, uh, more formally, that's when it gets tough. So 
I, I do think most people would be happier with that second option. Um, but you certainly don't need to go all the way to the third option of, you know, really taking a big risk, investing time and money and managing people. So there is like a sweet spot for a lot of people. Um, and yeah, so my plug again, so uh, my business partner and I started a brand called Wealth Pin. Uh, right now it's mostly an email newsletter, signup.wealthpin.com, where we share a lot of stuff and uh, we have some cool ways to help business owners. I won't plug it too hard, but just sign up for the new email newsletter and you'll see everything there. Um, and then parting words, I just, it's so interesting watching the Elon Musk thing unfold with Twitter right now. Mm -hmm. And I think you and I probably see eye to eye about it, Enoch, but I think what, and you brought up James Burnham, who did a great job kind of describing power dynamics and modernity. Um, but I think, you know, what a lot of normal people are missing is this is not about money. Twitter is a bad dollar and cents investment. This mm -hmm. is about controlling information flow which is very valuable and it may help you make money elsewhere. But the reason Elon wants it, the reason uh, the house of Saud and BlackRock and Vanguard want it is it's very <laughs> valuable for power, for controlling information flow, which is a huge part of power and modernity. So it's fascinating to watch this unfold in real time. And I'm sure your fans are hip to, you know, Burnham and Machiavelli and notions of power dynamics, but I'm seeing a lot of mainstream commentary that totally misses the boat. Because it's, you know, they're like, well, the, the the board members have a fiduciary duty. It's like, yes, that's true, but we're not playing in the realm of fiduciary duty. We're paying and playing in the realm of power. And um, you know, like I said, as as Pine Baron, I'm I'm minor nobility, <laughs> but I'm I'm noble enough to have seen that on a much smaller scale play out in my own life, whether it's with my local city council or you know, stuff with uh, clients in my own business. So Power dynamics are crucial, and uh, while money is a, a useful proxy for power, it's only a proxy. And uh, this Elon Musk Twitter situation is a really good large-scale uh, example of that playing out in the real world. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that insight. In I think the, the thread that could be weaved through both of them, and that is the tiniest uh, red pill that I present to my audiences can be said about my audience itself or normies on Twitter that are misreading the situation of power, as you've said it. And that is that there is a stratification in society. You mentioned that you're part of the minor nobility. There's minor nobility. You could say mid, <laughs> mid or medium to large size nobility up to a king and or kings. You know, in Ethiopia, historically, the title was King of Kings, as it was in, in uh, many other places. I think uh, Hakan, who's no longer with us on Twitter, it, you know, is like his name comes from the Turkish name for like the King of Kings. So there are a million different titles like that. I think the Persians and the, the, the Greeks may have had something like that, too. But that means that there are people, too. There are commoners. Uh, when there is nobility, it has to be in distinction with something else. So the basic idea that people are different, I don't think should be as controversial as it is, but it has many manifestations, including whether or not people decide to be employed versus self-employed and including whether or not they understand the power play going on between uh, Musk, uh, one of my favorite African-Americans and uh, the Twitter board. Right now. Yeah, Elon Musk and Charlize Theron, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I went um, to a great uh, Cuban joint the other day, and I think uh, I saw Cameron Diaz up in there too. I always forget she's cute. <laughs> well, I'm I'm really glad to end on that note and to shout you out and plug you. I you know I don't have anything to add to this conversation, but you've sent uh, me down the rabbit hole of uh, Ethiopians and uh, uh, monarchs and uh, uh, Emperor Haile Selassie, who is such an impressive and fascinating figure. Um, probably under uh, uh, represented in the Western world. So I just, I recommend your content for that and, and people to go down that rabbit hole because that's been really enriching and, and fascinating for me. Thank you so much. So, all right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Enoch. We'll talk soon.